Throughout his gospel, the anonymous author known as Matthew is intent upon presenting Jesus as a Moses-like figure. In his account of the Transfiguration, Jesus' face shines like Moses' did. And in the Transfiguration account, Moses is named before Elijah. Biblical scholars agree that it is impossible to say exactly what really happened in this event in Jesus' ministry. Mediterranean culture, however, offers us some helpful insights. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And look, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, look, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Do not tell the vision to anyone until the Sky Vault Man has been raised from the dead. Let's explore the cultural background of this story. Honor is the main Mediterranean cultural value, and it's on display in this account of the Transfiguration, big time. Jesus demonstrated power over demons, and that gave him a solid claim to honor in his culture. This ability stood in contrast to his known origins. Remember in the Gospel of John, Nathaniel's sarcastic question to Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? In other words, Nazareth was seen as a nothing place of nothing people. Consider power and shame. Jesus' power over demons also placed him in jeopardy. No one, not even his enemies, ever denied the reality of this power. But many Israelite leaders wondered about the source of Jesus' authority. Where do you get this authority? Who gave you this authority? Some concluded that Jesus was in cahoots with the devil. If Jesus does not possess legitimate power and authority, then he is arrogating to himself something to which he has no right. That would be very shameful. To complicate matters, power belongs to the realm of politics. In the Gospels, Jesus' healings and exorcisms are viewed by all, friend and foe alike, as political activities. This is the concern behind the puzzlement in Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. Folks, unapproved political activities could lead to an Israelite's death. Jesus was not unaware of these potential consequences of his ministry. The Matthean Jesus says to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Fully accepting the risk of his ministry, Jesus was also convinced that God would grant him ultimate honorable vindication. He would be raised by God. What an honor that is. Now consider the transfiguration and how it's described in the gospel called Matthew. Only this anonymous author we remember as Matthew refers to this experience as a vision. But you know, this is a most important piece of information. 
Modern psychological anthropology points out that alternative states of consciousness, like visions and dreams, are normal pan-human experiences common to the majority of the world's cultures. But cultures in which these are not so common except by way of dreaming while you're asleep, or under the influence of a substance, these would be cultures like our contemporary United States culture, the Baltic cultures. These are the anomalous cultures that have to be explained. They're not the normative ones. In Matthew's version of the Transfiguration, Jesus is obviously experiencing an alternate state of consciousness. Peter, James, and John are participants in this experience, during which they gain a clearer understanding of Jesus as one who lived on the brink of shame all the time, but still maintained a position of favor with the patron god of Israel. In all cultures, altered states of consciousness are normal means of learning otherwise impossible to gain new information. These three chosen disciples realized that, contrary to occasional appearances and impressions, Jesus was an honorable person whose activities were pleasing to God. Jesus' firm conviction that God would restore his honor by raising him from the dead was not a simple whistling in the dark. Instead, it was rooted in God's steadfast loving kindness, experienced in alternate reality. In Matthew's lifetime, many actual and potential Mediterranean believers in Jesus were troubled by his shameful death. If this man's life and ministry were pleasing to the God of Israel, why did it seem that God had abandoned him? The anonymous author remembered as Matthew portrays Jesus as another Moses, and this shows that God no more abandoned Jesus than he had abandoned Moses. Matthew exhorts his Jesus group to stand under the lordship of the risen Lord Jesus, who is a second Moses and lawgiver to his Jesus group. Jesus will come at the end to judge the Jesus group according to the new or better righteousness that he taught, just like Moses did on a mountain. What does the transfiguration story say to us contemporary Western believers? In his honor-shame culture, Jesus maintained steadfast loyalty and trust in God, no matter how shameful his life experiences appeared. To a large degree, Jesus had no other choice in his culture. But his loyalty, that is, his biblical faith, paid off. God restored honor to him in a way that no human ever could have. My friends, our culture in the West is very different. For us, individualistic self-reliance is highly valued. It is equally challenging to trust in God, especially when we feel we are fully in control of our lives and destinies. Would that the behavior of all believers in every culture would merit divine approval, that God would say of each of us, this is my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Hey, listen to what this person says. The great Carl Jung notes that all human beings are bad observers of things that are unfamiliar to them. 21st century Western people are extremely unfamiliar with the Mediterranean and Middle Eastern cultural world from which our scriptures and Jesus come. No one possesses immaculate perception, but many are infected by immaculate perception disease, the condition which makes people think they do. And when it comes to immaculate perception disease, my friends, we have a pandemic going. Every one of us, including the scholars and researchers, got baggage. And we inevitably start exploring things, like the Bible, from a personal perspective within our own culture, within our own personal history, within our own agendas, etc. Is there really any other way to begin? And that's true whenever we pick up a Bible. 
That is why comparative studies, such as psychological anthropology and other anthropological disciplines, are so pertinent to biblical study. The vast majority of biblical scholars, not to mention preachers and homilists, popular authors, and popular speakers, and even mystics in our time, all of us are outsiders to the culture we are investigating whenever we deal with scripture. And if we do not use a comparative approach, we run the risk of interpreting ancient Mediterranean texts talking about spirits and demons, like in the passage of the temptation of Jesus, or experiences like the transfiguration, anachronistically and ethnocentrically. Psychologically minded Western interpreters are ever eager to analyze ancient Middle Eastern persons, like Jesus, with tools developed in our Western culture. It's so easy to ethnocentrically conclude that demons in the gospel narratives were just clever symbols used to express addictive behavior of ancient people, or other psychological problems and mental illness. You see the psychological spin there? It's very easy for Western interpreters to look at a story like the Transfiguration and reduce it to just Jesus having an aha moment or a eureka moment. That the shine and the light is not really shine and light, but just Jesus having a realization. It's so easy for Western commenters to reduce the Transfiguration experience to a realization moment. The glow of being awake to something. But is that really what these stories are talking about? Since psychology and psychiatry from their beginnings have focused on individuals in industrial urban societies and have developed in that context, they are inescapably Western, ethnocentric to us, and incomplete sciences rooted in Freud and Freudian and Jung and Jungian matrices. They wonderfully apply to us, but not Jesus and his peers. Cultural anthropology and various subdisciplines like cross-cultural psychology featured on this Bible Alive YouTube channel provide a healthy and respectful understanding of the concepts needed in investigating biblical concepts like spirits and demons and the transfiguration and walking on the sea and Jesus' healings. We must rely upon cross-cultural psychology because psychology and psychiatry are monocultural disciplines too inextricably embedded into Western culture to be of significant use in analyzing the Mediterranean library we call the Bible.